Okay, welcome everybody. This is chapter 21 on the microbial infections that can populate the urogenital tract. And what we're going to look at is the anatomy and physiology of the genital urinal tract in, in brief summary. And then we're going to talk about the kinds of infections that you see. So what we have to understand about the urinary tract is that its main job is to regulate the body's fluid balance, its pH, uh, it has a role in erythropoiesis, and it filters nitrogenous waste from the blood. It's relatively anatomically simple. It's made up of two kidneys, two ureters, and a bladder. The kidneys are where the blood filtration takes place. The ureters convey the urine from the kidney to the bladder, and the bladder is going to empty the liquid waste into the urethra, and that's the trip out of the body. It's lined with a transitional epithelium that can distend and contract depending on how much fluid we find in the ureters or in the bladder, and it has smooth muscle in the walls of the bladder that aid in voiding. Very important that we understand that in males and females there are anatomical differences in the urogenital system. In males, the urethra serves as a common passageway for both sperm and urine, whereas in females, the, ure the urethra is strictly for the uh, release of urine. Other important anatomical differences are the fact that in the male, the, ureter is, um, the urethra is longer and has three parts. The prostatic urethra, which runs through the prostate gland, the membranous urethra that runs through the urogenital diaphragm, and then the penile urethra that runs through the penis. In males, the urethral opening is distant from the anus, whereas in females, the urethral opening is proximal to the anus. And this is one of the reasons that women are more prone to urinary tract infections than males are. The female urethra is shorter, and its location to the anus makes it a target for infection. Here you can see the anatomy of the urogenital system in the female. Notice how short the urethra is. The kidneys are um, relatively close to the posterior body wall at the level of the 11th and 12th false ribs. As a result, they don't have a lot of protection. They have a, uh, a capsule that surrounds and stabilizes their position. They sit behind the peritoneum, and a blow to that region of the back has the potential to dislodge the kidney and occlude the passage of urine from the kidney to the bladder, and that can potentially send the organ into failure. The concern with infection in the urogenital system is primarily uh, the potential, because this system is open to the outside world, for pathogens to work their way up the urethra into the bladder and then potentially up into the ureters and into the kidney. And the fact that we constantly produce and void urine is one of the ways that we flush the tract out and keep it relatively infection-free. It, it also encourages desquamation of the epithelia. Remember that all stratified epithelial tissue and transitional is a type of um, stratified epithelial tissue has the upper layer of cells um, shed constantly as they're being reproduced by the basal layer and this is a, a barrier to infection so it does not allow extensive colonization before those tissues are cleared. Normal biota are common threats to the urinary tract. Um, we know that the lining of the urinary tract have different chemical composition than those that line the GI tract. The GI tract, remember, is lined with simple columnar epithelia with apical microvilli. Here, the transitional epithelia are fundamentally different. Bacteria adapted to adhere to chemical surfaces in the GI aren't going to be able to hook up to the transitional epithelia that line the bladder and the ureters. The urine has an acidic pH. There's also lysozyme that weakens the peptidoglycan in the bacterial cell wall. And there's IgA present 
for organisms that have already been encountered in the environment. The female reproductive tract um, is different from the male reproductive tract. The male reproductive tract has a dual function um, at, the, at the urethra because it serves as a passageway for both urine and semen. In the male, the testes are the point of sperm production. It also generates hormones as part of its endocrine role. The sperm migrate from the seminiferous tubules to the epididymis where they become capable of swimming and then they merge into the vas deferens which em eventually empties into the ejaculatory duct which empties into the prostatic urethra. The prostate gland is a, is a gland that's about the size of um, a golf ball or a little bit smaller and it produces um, secretions that contribute to semen that provide a environment in which the sperm cells are able to use their flagella and survive. So it buffers the pH so that it's slightly alkaline. Um, there's also a considerable amount of fructose in the semen. A lot of that is contributed from the seminal vesicle uh, which fuses with the ejaculatory duct along with the vas deferens. The scrotum contains the testes which are outside the abdominal pelvic cavity for the purpose of cooling those organs and that optimizes sperm production. And the penis is going to house the penile urethra. Remember that it has three columns of erectile tissue, the corpus spongiosum that surrounds the penile urethra, and the paracorpora cavernosa on the dorsal penis. And when they engorge with blood, that's when an erection occurs. Defenses in the male reproductive system include the flushing action of the urine, which moves microbes out of the system. And you can see the anatomy here. Um, if we follow the path of sperm production, seminiferous tubules in the testes generate the sperm and then they move from the seminiferous tubules to the epididymis by way of the reet testis, the tubulus rectus, and the efferent ductules. The efferent ductules lead directly into the epididymis. Here they learn to swim, and then peristaltic action and ciliary activity work them up the vas deferens, and eventually they come around and they're going to hit the ampulla of the vas deferens, uh, you can see here, and then into the ejaculatory duct where the prostate gland and the seminal vesicle are going to dump their components into the semen, and then the bulbourethral gland will already have prepped the penile urethra for the entry of the semen by neutralizing the acidic pH of the urine, and then um, as a result of contraction of the ischiocavernosus and bulbospongiosus muscles along with peristaltic contractions along the urethra um, we will affect ejaculation. Okay, so Those are the cavernosa, those are the spongiosa. But again notice that the male urethra is much longer, right? So it's a longer trip for bacteria to get up uh, and into the bladder than in the female where the trip is shorter and the threat from the anus is far removed, right? Because we have structures um, that are in between the urethral opening and the anus in the male that aren't present in the female because her gonads are inside her body cavity. Now, in females, the reproductive system has two roles. It has to house the developing embryo, fetus, and neonate and it also has to produce and distribute eggs. It's made up of the uterus and the oviducts, the ovaries and the vagina, which communicates via the cervix um, to the uterus. The cervix has a neck and has two openings, the external os that communicates with the vagina and the internal os that communicates with the uterus. And this is what the baby's head goes through when it crowns in preparation for delivery. Defenses in the female reproductive tract include a mucous membrane 
and the protective covering of the secreted mucus, which is a nonspecific defense during childhood and menopause. Remember that mucus is sticky and it can trap pathogens. And there's also IgA in those secretions that can recognize foreign antigens from pathogens that have already been encountered in the environment. The pH of the vagina is a deterrent to microbial growth, and estrogen stimulates glycogen release. Bacteria ferment the glycogen and generate acids, and that lowers the vaginal pH to around 4.5. Prior to puberty, estrogen production drops, and the vagina goes to a neutral pH. That change, beginning in adolescence, changes the biota in the vagina, the biota in the female in their childbearing years is going to prevent the growth of microbes that could harm the developing fetus. And if you look here at the female urogenital system, what you see is a very short urethra, very close to the anus. Okay, so there's the potential for infection. And again, because of the short distance, it's easy for bacteria to travel up the urethra to the bladder and establish infection. But notice that the birth canal and the urethra are separate from each other here. And another important point with the female reproductive system is that it's an open system. There is a pathway, potential pathway, for pathogens to move from the birth canal through the cervix into the uterus and up the fallopian tubes and then exit via the opening between the fallopian tubes and the ovaries into the abdominal pelvic cavity and that can promote conditions such as pelvic inflammatory disease. And we also should note that this is part of what produces endometriosis is the escape of endometrial tissue from the uterus and it can populate the rectouterine or vesicouterine pouch and then as those tissues cycle along with the hormone changes that produce um, the normal uterine cycle it produces pain, discomfort, and bleeding, and it usually is treated either with hormones or with laparoscopic surgery. In the male, this is a closed system. When the sperm are produced and they move into the um, epididymis and the vas deferens, that's all one closed tube leading all the way to the exit at the tip of the urethra. Okay, So because this is an open system, it's more open to infection as well. So we're going to talk about the kinds of biota that you find in the genital urinary tract. Um, they are normally relatively sterile as a result of constant urine flow. And this is one of the reasons why the more urine you produce, the cleaner your tract stays. It's when urine production goes down that bacteria get a chance to establish colonies and move potentially up into the tract and cause problems. So we find non-hemolytic strep and staph. We find corny bacteria, lactobacillus. And those are important because they are going to crowd out pathogens normally. <clears throat> and their count is kept reasonably low. Now the female urethra is short. It's about a little over an inch long and very close to the anus. And as a result, we can get bacteria from the lower GI into the urethra and the bladder and that can produce UTIs. In the penis we see pseudomonas and staph and in uncircumcised penises um, we see anaerobic gram negatives. Um, one of those is Bacillus smegmatus okay? and it can live in the crevice between the glands and the prepuce, and this is why we circumcise the penis customarily. It's for hygienic reasons. Normal biota of the male genital tract, um, the urethra is the terminal organ here, and it has the same residence as we, cur as we previously listed, strep and staph and lactobacillus. After sexual activity, Microbes that can be associated with sexually transmitted diseases can establish colonies inside the system. In the female genital tract, only the vagina harbors microbes under normal circumstances. 
before puberty and after menopause, the neutral pH of the vagina harbors the same biota as in the urethra. After puberty, estrogen leads to an acidic pH in the vagina, and that's going to change what lives there. Lactobacillus likes the acidic environment and contributes to it by converting sugars into acids. And this, combined with the acidic environment, discourages microbial growth. Candida also enjoys this low pH. Now, it's interesting that this low pH that's protective against pathogens in the female reproductive system is also hostile to sperm cells. They don't like the acidic pH, and that's part of the buffering capacity of the semen that allows them to live long enough, hopefully, to swim all the way up the fallopian tube and find the egg. Um, in point of fact, though, many of the sperm cells in a typical ejaculate bite the dust, uh, in part because of the hostile environment of the female reproductive tract, but also because sperm, for lack of a better description, are stupid. They just go where they're pointed, and a lot of them try to do things like fertilize the uterus or fertilize the cervix of those that don't engage in that activity. A half are going to swim up the wrong fallopian tube, and those that swim up the correct fallopian tube, uh, many are going to miss the egg, they're going to overshoot it, some are going to stop short, and at the end of the day you only get a few dozen sperm that actually attach to the corona radiata of the egg, and of those, only one normally makes it all the way to the egg membrane and affects fertilization. So that's why a guy has to have um, over uh, probably 15 million sperm per mil of ejaculate to be considered on the bottom end of fertile. Uh, if he has below 10 million, he's functionally sterile because realistically there just aren't enough sperm there to get the job done in, in normal reproduction. So we're going to talk about the virulence factors that um, allow disease to take hold in the urogenital tract, and then we'll talk about leptospirosis. So UTIs, um, this is a, a common infection that we see in clinical care. And the more urine you produce, the less likely you are to have a UTI. When we get UTIs, it's usually because we have to put a catheter in you or your urine production is down for some reason. Perhaps kidney function is affected. Cystitis is just an infection of the bladder that occurs in um, the face of reduced urine production. Pyelonephritis is an infection of the kidneys, and urethritis is an inflammation of the urethra. Cystitis is a disease of sudden onset. We usually see pain and urinary urgency and dysuria, which is a burning that comes with urination. It can be cloudy because the bacteria and the white blood cells are in there. Uh, that condition is known as pyuria, right, pus in the urine. We can also see blood in the urine. That's hematuria. Uh, Low-grade fever and nausea. Uh, we see back pain. We see high fever. A serious infection can result in damage to the kidneys if it's inadequately treated. And frequently, um, this can be accompanied by referred pain that can radiate through the abdominal pelvic region. An acute, uncomplicated UTI involves only the bladder. Causative agents have to be established, right? We have to do um, culture to see what's growing in there. Or we can um, take a sample and do some of the rapid methods like ELISA and PCR to determine the causative agents. Catheter-assisted UTIs are 95% of um, UTIs, and they generally come from normal biota in the GI. E. coli is responsible for 80%. Staph and enterococcus can also be in there. Um, the E. coli, again, coming from the GI, right? It's a normal occupant of the, of the large intestine, and that's where it belongs, and it's when it manages to make it up into the urogenital that we have trouble. There are other UTIs that be, can be acquired in a clinical setting. They're not transmitted from person to person, 
um, but they can go from the GI to the urinary. They're more common in females because of the proximity of the anus to the opening of the urethra. Many women have recurrent UTIs. Some E. coli can get into the deep tissues of the urinary tract and avoid antibiotics, and they emerge later and cause symptoms. In catheter-assisted UTIs, we see the causative agents as E. coli, Enterococcus klebsiella. Um, National Healthcare Safety Network is now recommending minimizing the use of catheters to limit introducing the bacteria into the urogenital tract. Um, this is also obviously why catheter, catheters are dispo single use. Okay, And even at that, they're going to have microbes on them. How do we treat? Sulfa drugs can be used. Non-antibiotics such as peridium can be administered at the same time and that relieves some of the symptoms of the burning and urgency. Usually a two-day course is recommended. The azo dye turns the urine dark red or orange. A large amount of E. coli strains are penicillin resistant. Strain ST131 is virulent and resistant to multiple antibiotics and again this is the result of improper use of antibiotics um, as prescribed by your doctor. If you take antibiotics only until you feel better, you're going to be selecting for resistant strains of bacteria, and they can go out into population and exchange genetic material with other strains that are resistant to other antibiotics, and the result then is that both participants come away from that exchange of information resistant to both antibiotics. And that's how we end up with the phenomena of superbugs. So this is a little bit on leptospirosis. Our pets are wonderful friends and they help us in so many ways. But we need to take some smart precautions when caring for our pet friends and when visiting petting zoos. You may remember this last spring over 20 children became ill after visiting a petting zoo in central Florida from E. coli exposure. Good sanitation and proper regulations keep such occurrences rare. However, there is another disease that all dog owners and outdoor enthusiasts should be aware of, leptospirosis. This bacterial disease affects humans and their pet friends and causes a wide range of symptoms, including flu-like illness and even kidney damage. Leptospirosis is usually caused by exposure to water where pets or wildlife have been. We have seen several cases of lepto in our hospital. Most of them do get better with aggressive antibiotic therapy, especially if we treat them early enough. And I can also say that all of the cases we've seen have not been vaccinated. This bacteria enters the body through the mouth or even the skin and can cause rather serious kidney disease within a few days to a few weeks. The incidence of leptospirosis is on the rise with urban children and people who work outdoors or with animals. It's also being seen more frequently in our family dogs. Prevention is the key, and for that, we have a very effective vaccination. Dr. Jasek recommends all dogs at risk be vaccinated for lepto at the time they get their regular booster shots. Remember, dogs age seven years for every one human year, so veterinarians now recommend having your pet examined at least twice a year. Dogs do age faster than people, so waiting a full year to see your veterinarian would be like you seeing your physician every seven years, and that's not smart. I'm Dr. Jim Humphreys reporting. So there's the rundown. Okay. We want to talk about chlamydia and gonorrhea. These are STIs. Distinguish between vaginitis and vaginosis. Talk about prostatitis. We'll differentiate between diseases that cause genital warts. Talk about cancer vaccines and talk about group B strep and why that group is important. Not all reproductive tract diseases are sexually transmitted, but many of them are. Vaginitis may or may not be sexually transmitted. Prostatitis is not sexually transmitted. STIs are 
increasingly common in the United States and other industrialized nations. Discharge diseases are responsible for unprecedented numbers of infertility cases, primarily because they produce scar tissue in the reproductive tract, and that can impede the movement of gametes through the tract and impede fertilization. Herpes and HPV infections are incurable, and again, that's because viruses are able to hide inside healthy tissue and avoid places where drug delivery would normally be effective. And in addition to that, we know that viruses use our own reproductive machinery in order to make copies of themselves, and thus um, anything that's going to be an effective antiviral is likely going to impact normal cellular function. And that's why there are so few effective antivirals compared to effective antibiotics, antiprotozoals, antifungals. Discharge diseases are infectious agents that cause an increase in fluid discharge in the reproductive tract of men and women. Causative agents are transferred to new hosts when the fluids in which they live contact the mucosal surfaces of the receiving partner. Trichomoniasis and gonorrhea are two common discharge diseases along with chlamydia. Now remember that uh, gonorrhea is caused by a bacteria. Trichomoniasis is a protozoal disease, right? We talked about that in the chapter on uh, GI diseases and it's caused by a nematode that can form cysts in undercooked meat such as pork, okay? And we'll also discuss chlamydia. So this is a look at gonorrhea. Of the many sexually transmitted infections, or STIs, gonorrhea is the second most common. The most common STI is chlamydia. Chlamydia. And we'll talk more about chlamydia later. Right now let's focus on gonorrhea and why these two happen together. These two diseases often occur together for two reasons. First, they have similar risk factors, which include things like having multiple sexual partners and or having frequent unprotected sex. The other reason is that infection with one of these bugs makes your body susceptible to a second infection by dampening the immune system. So I promise we'll go into more detail about chlamydia later, but for now let's talk more about gonorrhea. It's caused by a bug referred to as Neisseria gonorrhoeae. And the reason why we call gonorrhea a sexually transmitted infection is because it undergoes this process referred to as transmission, where it moves from one person to another by several mechanisms. Most commonly, gonorrhea will be transmitted through sex, which can include oral sex, vaginal sex, or even anal sex. Another important mechanism of transmission includes childbirth, and we'll talk more about the outcomes of that in a minute. So these are the main ways that gonorrhea can be transmitted. So let's move this off to the side, and let's focus instead on my poor friend over here who's going to have all the different signs and symptoms a person can get with gonorrhea. Now, because we said the main way gonorrhea spreads from one person to the other is by sex, let's start by focusing on signs and symptoms at our sexual organs. So here you can see on the left, I have female genitalia drawn out, and on the right side, we have male genitalia drawn here. So if we were to imagine our gonorrhea infection, so I'll use this as sort of a way to mimic gonorrhea as it spreads. Perhaps you can have a female infecting a male with gonorrhea, and so because the penis is used during sex, that can actually seed or spread up the urethra. So this yellow line here, that is your urethra. And we'll go into this in more detail in another video, but the gonorrhea bacteria will latch on to the walls in your urethra. Your urethra is lined by epithelial cells, and so this bacterium will enter those cells. That will trigger an immune response. Your white blood cells will detect that something is wrong, and they'll come up to the urethra through the bloodstream to attack wherever the gonorrhea has spread. So if the gonorrhea has only entered a single epithelial cell in your urethra, it'll cause that cell to die in a process that's referred to as apoptosis. Maybe you've heard of it. It's where the body specifically decides to kill a cell because it's doing something wrong or it's been infected, like in this case. 
Now, in the ideal world, the white blood cell will kill off this one epithelial cell in the urethra that's been infected, and we'd be done with the infection. But oftentimes, there are multiple organisms that kind of spread along the urethral tract, which cause more white blood cells to come from the bloodstream to attack the bacteria or the cells that are infected. And as a result, you get inflammation. Inflammation of the urethra, causing things like pain when you urinate, maybe some burning that's there as well, and general discomfort. So because of the bacterium, your urethra will cause you a lot of pain, and you've got what's referred to as urethritis. If the gonorrhea spreads up here to your prostate, this pink thing is your prostate, you can get what's called prostatitis. And this inflammatory process that's occurring along the way causes white blood cells that may die and epithelial cells that will also undergo apoptosis with some of the gonorrheal bacteria to slough off and fall through and come out from the urethral meatus or the end of the penis. And you can actually see pus coming out of the penis. Now just like the epithelial cells within your urethra, gonorrhea can also affect the epithelial cells that line the anus or even higher up here in the rectum. As a result, you might not see pus coming out from the anus, and instead you might see infections of the cells that line the anus or of the anus. And so this skin infection you'd see here are referred to as pustules. Pustules. And again, that's from the gonorrheal bacteria infecting the epithelial cells of the anus. You can also have pustules occur in the female. So let's label that right here as well as urethritis, but because of the difference in anatomy between the male and the female, you may also see an infection of the vagina or vaginitis. More commonly though, infected women will have pain during sex because of pressure that's put on the cervix due to the gonorrhea that's spread there causing cervicitis. cervicitis. Gonorrhea can spread even further up from the cervix through the uterus and actually come out the fallopian tubes to cause an infection within the pelvic cavity, which is why it's called pelvic inflammatory disease. Pelvic inflammatory disease, or PID. Now from the genital tract, gonorrhea can spread into the bloodstream and go elsewhere in the body. And quite classically, it goes to your joints, like the knee over here, to cause arthritis by infecting the joint capsule. So down below here, you can see the joint capsule. Here's bone, here's articular cartilage, and this is synovial fluid, or just some fluid in between the two bones and the joint. So if gonorrhea spreads here, think about what else is going to come right after it. White blood cells. Remember, they're going to come chasing after the gonorrhea, and they're going to cause inflammation. And if you notice in this picture, there's not a lot of space between the two sets of articular cartilage and the bones here. So if too many white blood cells get into the synovial cavity and cause inflammation, you're going to have a more difficult time using that joint, which leads to pain in the knee and difficulty walking. Left untreated, gonorrhea can also spread to the central nervous system. Gonorrhea can infect the lining around the brain and the spinal cord. This lining is referred to as the meninges, the meninges. And an infection of the meninges is referred to as meningitis, meningitis. And unfortunately, gonorrheal meningitis is more common in children than it is adults. And speaking of children, I mentioned earlier that you can spread gonorrhea through childbirth. An infected mother can spread the infection if undetected to her child. And very early on, you would know if a child is infected with gonorrhea if they look like this. You'll notice that the baby may have this very signature crusting of the eyes that's referred to as gonococcal ophthalmia, which is just to say that you have an ophthalmic or an eye infection of gonorrhea. This baby can also have a variety of other issues related to the gonorrhea, such as meningitis, as we talked about, or even pneumonia, which is why Neisseria gonorrhoeae, or gonococcus, is one of the bugs pregnant women are often screened for and treated for before they give birth to decrease the odds of this sort of thing happening. Here's a look at chlamydia. Chlamydia 
is the most common sexually transmitted infection in the world. Sexually transmitted infection. And you might recall from our conversation about gonorrhea, chlamydia often co-infects with gonorrhea, or they tend to occur together. Now there are several species of chlamydia that exist, but when we talk about the most common STI that's responsible for the disease chlamydia, we're talking about chlamydia trachomatis. Trachomatis. And the way it gets this name, trachoma, is the term for the eye infection that occurs with chlamydia, as we'll talk about in a minute. Now, with any sexually transmitted infection, we have to consider the mechanism by which the infection spreads from one person to another. And that process is called transmission. And there are several ways that chlamydia is transmitted from one person to another. Sex is the most common way, and that can include oral sex, vaginal sex, and anal sex. Childbirth is another important mechanism for transmission, as we'll talk about in a few minutes. And finally, one of the unique ways that we can transmit chlamydia that we can't with many other sexually transmitted infections is with direct contact. Now, I want to throw a big asterisk over here. Because chlamydia can only live outside of a human host for about a few seconds to a minute. So direct contact means something like scratching an infected organ of the body, say part of the genitalia, and then directly touching another part of the body, like the eye. This doesn't count for one person touching another person directly and spreading the infection. That's very rare and unlikely to occur. Direct contact means to spread from a person to another part of that same person's body. And we'll talk about that in the case of conjunctivitis or an eye infection of chlamydia. So now let's move this list off to the side and focus on my poor friend right here, who's going to have all the different signs and symptoms you can get with chlamydia. Now, as I mentioned already, chlamydia is mainly spread through sex. So why don't we start by focusing on the sexual organs right here, which I've drawn out already. And I want to label this side as the female. So right here is the urethra. Right here is the entrance to the vagina, the vagina, which leads up here to the cervix, the cervix. And I won't label it here, but this is the anus, and this leads up to the rectum and the rest of your lower gastrointestinal tract. And on this side, we have the male that starts with the penis, the testicle, the prostate, the bladder, the urethra, and I'll label the rest of this in a minute. But let's focus here on the female. Now let's say, for instance, that this female is infected by a male, and so Here's a chlamydia trachomatis bacterium that's making its way into the vagina. And I'll just label this as our key up here. That's what I'm going to draw chlamydia to look like. And from here, the chlamydia will multiply and spread further up the genital tract on its way to the cervix. And the same thing can occur with the urethra nearby. Perhaps we can have chlamydia spread up this way and into the urethra. And the interesting thing about chlamydia is that it's predominantly an intracellular organism or an intracellular bacterium, which just means that it likes to live within a cell, which in this case means the human host cell or the epithelial cells that line the vagina or the epithelial cells that line the urethra. Now, the symptoms that we have that are associated with chlamydia are due to the white blood cells that come and attack the bacterium. What they do is that they'll notice that there are chlamydia inside of these epithelial cells, and they will target the cells that are infected to cause a process that's called apoptosis. Apoptosis, which is the very neat and organized killing of a specifically selected cell. So I'll write here cell death. So it's cell death that is programmed by the white blood cell. Now, as I've drawn here, we usually don't have a single chlamydia bacterium that comes to infect the genital tract or the urinary tract. You're going to have many of these guys that are inoculated or spread into the tract. So there's going to be, as a result, a lot of white blood cells that come from the bloodstream to the genital or the urinary tract to attack the infected epithelial cells or any chlamydia they can eat up that's outside of the cells at the time. And when all these white blood cells show up from the bloodstream and go to the genital or the urinary tract where they're not supposed to usually be, we get this process of inflammation. Inflammation. And that's what causes us the swelling, the burning, and the general pain that's associated with a chlamydia infection. That means that at the urethra, when it gets infected, you have urethritis. Urethritis. And the burning sensation you have when you pee 
is called dysuria. Dysuria, which just means urea referring to the urinary tract, and dys meaning some complication or something that's out of whack or has a disorder. Dysuria. The same can be said for an infection of the epithelial cells that line the vagina, resulting in vaginitis. Or if they go further up here to the cervix, you get cervicitis. Cervicitis. And just like there's a term for painful urination, there's a term for painful sex or intercourse, and that's called dis, which means disorder again, perunia, dyspareunia, where perunia just means the act of intercourse or sex. Now there are a lot of similarities that you can draw here in the case of the male. So say if we have some of the chlamydia bacteria spreading up the urethra, the urethra, that'll cause urethritis. Or if it spreads up here to the prostate, this pink guy over here, that's the prostate, you can get prostatitis. Prostatitis. Now the one thing I should mention that's different in the case of the female versus the male is that there's an opening from the uterus into the abdominal cavity through the fallopian tubes. And so if the chlamydia spreads so far up through the cervix into the uterus and out the fallopian tubes, they can actually seed or spread into the abdominal cavity. And this happens as well with gonorrhea. And the term we use for this type of infection is called pelvic inflammatory, pelvic inflammatory disease. Pelvic inflammatory disease, or PID. And there are several other complications that can occur because of having PID. And we'll talk about that in a separate video. And I've run out of space to show it here, but another very telltale sign of a sexually transmitted infection, especially when white blood cells are coming from the bloodstream to attack the infected epithelial cells and the bacteria, you're going to have that apoptosis or that cell death that occurs along the way. And so the dead epithelial cells, the dead white blood cells, and even the bacteria will come out of the tip of the penis from the urethra or from the urethra in the female. And what you'll actually see is pus. So you're going to have what can also be referred to as a creamy purulent discharge, or just pus, that represents the dead white blood cells, epithelial cells, and bacteria that are being essentially peed away. Now from the genitals, chlamydia can spread into the bloodstream to go elsewhere in the body. And there are a couple of very classic places it shows up. One place it can spread from the bloodstream, right here, is the eye. So I've drawn this gentleman's eye down over here, and he's looking downward. And remember, as I mentioned just now, in addition to spreading from the bloodstream, chlamydia can also spread from direct contact into the eye. Let's say if there's some pus that's discharged and a person is confused about why that's coming out and they touch it with their finger and then rub their eye, you can directly spread chlamydia into the eye. And it starts by affecting this reddish portion right here, and that's called the conjunctiva, the conjunctiva, which is just a fancy name for the inside of the eyelid. Now if the chlamydia spreads here, what you're going to start seeing are these bumps that occur on the conjunctiva, on the inside of the eyelid. And these bumps will accumulate and start scratching on the eye. And when they scratch on the eye, they're going to start causing irritation here as well. And so the conjunctiva, which is infected, will now be, can be referred to as conjunctivitis. But once you start irritating the white of the eye over here, you may actually even spread the infection over the pupil here to cause what's called an opacity, which just means this whitening over the pupil that makes it difficult for you to see. And this is what is referred to as trachoma. Trachoma, which is the most common cause of blindness in the developing world. Another site that can be affected from the bloodstream are your joints. So this knee right here can be infected. So we refer to this specifically as infective arthritis. Infective arthritis. I'll write arthritis here a little more in the middle. Infective arthritis, which is exactly what you would imagine. The chlamydia spreads from the bloodstream into your joint capsule right here. This white layer is bone, here's bone as well, and this gray portion is the articular cartilage, or the cartilage that separates the bones from each other. And in between, in the joint capsule, or this synovial cavity, is this fluid. It's referred to as synovial fluid. 
that sort of helps the bones move on top of each other smoothly. So remember, as chlamydia makes it into any part of the body, not just in the joint, but also the urethra, you're going to have white blood cells that come right after it. And these guys are chasing it with a vengeance, and so you're going to have those telltale signs of inflammation occurring here in the joint as well. And I'm sure you can imagine that having a ton of white blood cells here within the joint makes it very difficult for you to have smooth movement if, in addition to the fluid, you've got these white blood cells, and now you've got some chlamydia that's here, you're going to have a lot of pain and difficulty moving. And the term for painful joints is dysarthria. Dysarthria, which dys again means some type of disorder, and arthria refers to the joint, dysarthria. Now a unique thing about chlamydia is that in addition to infective arthritis, you can also have something that's referred to as reactive arthritis reactive arthritis. And this is a very distinct beast from infective arthritis in that reactive arthritis is the result of the antibodies that you make. So I'll just write AB for antibodies. The antibodies that you're supposed to make against the chlamydia, which for some reason in this case will attack both the chlamydia trachomatis as well as the joint for some reason. So reactive arthritis is the result of antibodies that are supposed to attack the chlamydia for some reason mistaking proteins in the joint for the same proteins that are on the chlamydia and traveling to the joint to attack it as well. And when antibodies flow into some space, the similar thing happens as what we saw here with infective arthritis. White blood cells will also rush to the site to help the antibodies attack whatever it is they're attacking, and unfortunately in this case, those include proteins that are naturally found in the joint capsule. This is a really unusual phenomenon that occurs, and it's sometimes associated with chlamydia, and in fact has its own name or syndrome. This is called Reiter's syndrome. Reiter's syndrome. And it can be best remembered by this popular mnemonic, where if you have Reiter's syndrome, you can't see because you've got trachoma, like you do here. You can't pee because you have urethritis. And then on top of that, you can't even climb a tree because you've got reactive arthritis. Now, in addition to Reiter's syndrome, if you have an infected mother, she can spread chlamydia to her newborn child and have something like this occur. And this is referred to as neonatal chlamydia. Neonatal chlamydia. And first off, you might notice here the crusting of the eye, which is similar to something we already talked about. This is conjunctivitis, but you can also see pneumonia in an infected newborn. And depending on how much the chlamydia will multiply and spread to the baby in the uterus, you may also have premature labor, so the baby will be delivered earlier than they should be, or even death, which is why it's important for pregnant women to be checked for chlamydia, because this disorder can be completely preventable. And here's the rundown on each. Okay. Vaginitis and vaginosis. Uh, again, vaginitis and inflammation of the vagina. We see itching. Um, and we also may see burning and discharge. Vaginosis is similar to vaginitis, but does not have the accompanying inflammation. It can be caused by bacteria and protozoa. It can be caused by fungi such as candida. Um, not, we commonly call that a yeast infection. Most women experience this condition one or more times during their lifetime. Candida is a filamentous fungus. And it's normal in about around average of 75% of humans. It's usually kept in low numbers as a result of our normal defenses, right? Our mucus secretions and the action of our granulocytes and our adaptive immunity keep it in check. Uh, in individuals that have um, suppressed immune function, we sometimes see uh, candida um, populate and colonize. Candidiasis um, is a condition uh, that can occur in the oral cavity. It can also occur in other um, systems that are open to the outside world, among them the reproductive system. 
vulvovaginal candidiasis is where the yeast is detectable as a wet prep or on a gram stain of material obtained during a pelvic exam. Now it's important to understand that the yeast are not going to gram stain, right? They're going to be uh, resistant to the gram stain as a result of the, the makeup of their cell wall. But you can tell the appearance of the yeast under the microscope because of the presence of hyphae and the appearance of buds. Yeast are unusual in that they can reproduce both sexually and asexually. They reproduce asexually by producing buds. They can generate new vegetative yeast. And they produce sexually by um, sexual hyphae fusing and producing now uh, strains of yeast that are going to exhibit more genetic diversity. In otherwise healthy people, the fungus is not invasive. Candida infections in the blood can occur, and they're usually lethal when they do. They don't normally stem from vaginal infections, and they're seen frequently in clinical environments. AIDS patients are at risk for systemic candida because of the suppression of normal immune function. Vaginal infections are almost always opportunistic. Disruptions in normal biota or tiny changes in mucosal epithelia in the vagina can lead to overgrowth of the fungus. Mechanical disruptions can traumatize the vagina and provide a port of entry. Chemical disruptions, such as those from broad-spec antibiotics, diminish the vaginal bacterial population and then the yeast can take hold. Diabetics and pregnant women are predisposed to vaginal yeast overgrowth. Some women are prone to infections during menstruation as well. It's possible to transmit yeast through sexual contact if the woman is experiencing candidiasis, but the recipient's immune system is normally going to keep it in check. The yeast may be passed back to the original partner if sexual activity continues. Women with HIV experience recurring infections because the immune system is suppressed, right? Remember that HIV hits the helper T cells, which have as their primary task to stimulate the division and growth and um, the um, multiplication of the lymphocytes that are going to go out and destroy um, pathogens with a particular antigen or infected cells that display those antigens. A tiny percentage of women with no underlying immune disease can have vaginal infections with candida and that's likely a strain specific and gene specific phenomenon. Okay? Um, remember that the ability to colonize a tissue is in part due to the the victim's genetics and in part due to the genetics of the strain that it's growing. There's no vaccine for candida. Oral azol drugs can treat vaginal candidiasis and they're available over the counter. If infections recur frequently or don't resolve, it's important to go to your doctor. Vaginosis is a common infection in women during childbearing years doesn't appear to induce inflammation in the vagina. It's also known as bacterial vaginosis. We see a discharge with a fishy odor as a result of the byproducts generated by anaerobic bacteria. It's a result of a shift from good to bad bacteria. Um, your normal flora would keep this pathogen in check, but what happens is a change in conditions that promote the growth of your normal flora, let these species in. They allow them a foothold. It's likely a mixed infection that causes this condition. Mobiolunculus is found in high numbers. Pathogenesis is not well understood. It can lead to PID and infertility and ectopic pregnancy. Um, the reason for the ectopic pregnancy, remember, is the production of scar tissue in the oviduct and that can impede the movement of the egg down to the uterus, right? And if that egg gets fertilized it can implant in the tube and that's a tubal pregnancy. 
babies can be born to mothers that have vaginosis and the babies can have low birth weight. It's not considered sexually transmitted. It's very common in sexually active women and may be associated with sex, but it's not transmitted by sex. It could occur if the act of penetration in the absence of semen causes changes in the biota. We don't know exactly what causes the increased numbers of Gardner Gardnerellia. Low pH is typically higher in vaginosis. How do we culture? A stain of the secretions of the sloughed epithelial cells can pick this up. Normally vaginal epithelial cells don't have much bacteria on them. These diseases are called clue cells, um, those that have bacteria attached to them and are a diagnostic indicator. It can also be found in a pap smear. And you can see down here normal epithelial cells and pap smear with attached bacteria indicating a colonization event. Women who find the condition uncomfortable or who are planning on getting pregnant need to be treated. Those who use IUDs should also be treated. They can provide a way for the pathogen to get inside, right? Anything that you're putting into the urogenital tract is the, has the potential to be a port of entry for a pathogen. The usual treatment is oral or topical metronidazole or clindamycin. Trichomonas vaginalis is a protozoan, has flagella that allows it to propel itself. It has no cyst form and does not survive long out of the host. It causes asymptomatic infections in half of women and males. It's considered asymptomatic infectious agent rather than a normal biota. Some people experience long-term negative effects. Males usually don't have symptoms. Females can produce a green discharge. Chronic infection can make a person more susceptible to other infections, including HIV. And so that's an example of what's called a secondary infection. Women who have been infected during pregnancy are predisposed to premature labor and low birth weight infants. It's easily transmitted through sexual contact since it's common biota in many people. It does not undergo opportunistic shifts within the host. It does not become symptomatic um, under certain conditions, and it causes symptoms when transmitted to a non-carrier. Now, prostatitis is just a blanket term for inflammation of the prostate gland. The prostate gland sits under the bladder and encloses the prostatic urethra, and its normal job is to produce secretions in the semen that improve the likelihood that the sperm cells are going to live long enough to fertilize the egg. The danger with prostatitis is that it can occlude the prostatic urethra and then you're unable to urinate and the urine can back up into the kidney and can adversely affect kidney function. Acute prostatitis is generally from bacterial infection. The bacterial or normal biota in the intestinal tract that may have caused a previous UTI. Chronic prostatitis can be caused by bacteria and it's frequently unresponsive to antibiotics because it's frequently a biofilm. Remember that biofilms are communities of bacteria that act to protect each other and this makes them more difficult to knock out with a single drug. Some forms don't have a microbial cause Though infectious disease specialists feel that one or more bacteria are involved, it can't be cultured using current techniques. And so this is where, again, PCR and ELISA come in handy, right? If you can't culture it, you can still detect it using these methods that are extremely sensitive. Symptoms, pain in the groin and lower back, urge to urinate, but difficulty urinating because the prostatic urethra is blocked. Hematuria painful ejaculation. We treat with broad-spec antibiotics. Ulcers are sores in the epithelia that can bleed and the danger of course is that they can cavitate to the point that pathogens can get into the blood. 
Lesions on the genitals can be caused by syphilis or chancroid or genital herpes. Okay? Syphilis is bacterial, genital herpes obviously is viral. Infection with an ulcer increases the chances of infection with HIV because the open lesions are a direct pathway to the blood supply. So here's a look at syphilis. Okay, chancroid is an ulcerative disease that begins as a papule at the point of contact. It can develop into a chancre, which is painful in men, but in women may go unnoticed. Inguinal lymph nodes become swollen and tender. Remember, those are down, the ones down near the groin. The causative agent is Haemophilus duceria. It's a pleomorphic gram-negative rod. Hemolysin is important in the pathogenesis of the chancroid. Remember that that's the compound that ruptures red blood cells. It's common in the tropics and subtropics, but it's becoming more common in the U.S. It's transmitted through direct contact, especially sexual contact, and it's associated with prostitutes and poor hygiene. Uncircumcised men seem to be more commonly infected than those that are circumcised. People may be asymptomatic carriers as well. This is a look at genital herpes. This is the rundown of syphilis, chancroid, and herpes. Okay. Remember, bacterial, bacterial, viral. Thus, the treatment is different for the bacterial and the viral infection. This is a look at human papillomavirus. Human papillomaviruses, also called HPVs, make up a group of over a hundred related viruses that infect people. Most HPVs can cause common skin warts, usually on the hands or feet. However, about 40 types of HPV infect the genitals, which are the sex organs on the outside of the body. These HPVs cause the most common sexually transmitted infections, illnesses transmitted from one person to another through sexual activity. Some genital HPVs are low risk and may only cause warts on and around the genitals and anus of both women and men. Rarely, these HPVs can also cause warts inside the mouth and throat. Other genital HPVs are high risk they can lead to cancer of the lower end of a woman's uterus, called the cervix. Less commonly, these HPVs can lead to other genital, anal, or oral cancers in both women and men. It's important to know that most HPV infections cause no symptoms, and the low-risk genital HPVs that cause warts are not an important cause of cancer. People infected with either a high-risk or a low-risk genital HPV spread it through skin-to-skin -skin contact during vaginal, anal, or oral sex. For infection to occur, HPV enters through tiny cuts in the skin around or inside the penis, vagina, throat, or anus. The virus makes its way down to the cells in the bottom or basal layer of skin and infects them. As the infected cells divide, the virus begins to make copies of itself. Eventually, the infected cells move up through the skin layers, releasing new viruses that can spread the infection to other cells. For most people, the cells of the immune system can destroy the infected cells, along with the virus, within two years. But in some people, the immune system isn't able to destroy all of the viruses, leading to an infection that doesn't go away. HPV-infected cells may multiply over several weeks or months. 
If the cells are infected with low-risk HPV, they begin to form warts around the genitals. If the HPV is high-risk, it may damage the cell's genetic material, causing the cells to become precancerous. Over a period of years, a cancerous tumor may slowly form as the damaged cells continue to multiply. The most common cancer from high-risk genital HPV is cervical cancer. There is no cure for any type of HPV infection. However, the Gardasil vaccine can help protect against two of the most common high-risk HPVs that cause genital cancers. The vaccine also helps protect against two of the most common low-risk HPVs that cause genital warts. For best protection, preteen girls and boys should receive three doses of the vaccine over a period of six months before any sexual activity takes place. The vaccine injects dead proteins from HPV viruses into the bloodstream. These proteins don't cause infection. But the proteins do stimulate certain immune cells to create markers called antibodies that can identify these HPVs. Later, if the live versions of these viruses invade the skin, the antibodies recognize and attach to them. These immune cells destroy the marked viruses, which prevents an infection from happening. It is important to note that the vaccine does not protect against other types of HPV not included in the vaccine. The vaccine also doesn't reliably treat cells that are already infected. High-risk genital HPVs that cause cervical cancer are most treatable when diagnosed early. Women should have a pap test to see if their cervix has abnormal or precancerous cells even if they've had an HPV vaccine. Check with a healthcare provider to find out how often to get this test. During this procedure, a healthcare provider will collect a small sample of cells from the cervix. These cells will be examined under a microscope to see if they're abnormal or cancerous. A separate HPV test will look for genetic material from high-risk types of HPV. When a pap test and HPV test are done together, it's called co-testing. If these tests show abnormal cells, a healthcare provider will recommend specific treatment based on the woman's age, medical history, and the abnormality of her cells. While there is no cure for an HPV infection, both abnormal and cancerous cells can be treated. Some types of HPV can cause common skin warts or genital warts. The warts may go away without treatment as the immune system fights off the HPV infection. If the warts are painful or don't go away, visit a healthcare provider so they can examine the warts to determine the best way to remove them. Although you can treat common warts at home, do not treat genital warts yourself. Procedures to remove either common warts or genital warts include freezing with cryotherapy, burning with an electric current called electrocautery, or by surgical removal. For more information, talk to a healthcare professional. Molluscum contagiosum is an unclassified virus in the Pox viridae family. It can take the form of skin lesions, it can be transmitted sexually. Wart-like growths result from an infection that can be found on the mucous membranes or the skin of the genital area. Few problems are associated with these growths beyond the presence of the warts themselves. In severely immunocompromised individuals, the disease is more serious. The virus can be transmitted through fomites, such as clothing or towels, and auto, auto, also auto-inoculation. And here's a look at 
HPV, and molluscum contagiosum. Okay, group B strep. 10 to 40 percent of women in the U.S. are colonized asymptomatically by beta hemolytic strep. Non-pregnant women experience no ill effects from the colonization. Colonization of pregnant women can result in preterm delivery. Half of the infants get colonized with the bacteria during passage through the birth canal or ascension of the bacteria through ruptured membranes. The colonization is considered a reproductive tract disease. A small percentage of infants have life-threatening blood infections leading to meningitis or pneumonia. If they recover from these acute conditions, they can have permanent disabilities such as developmental disabilities, hearing loss, or impaired vision. In some cases, the mothers experience the disease as amniotic infection or subsequent stillbirths can be an outcome of this. In 02, the CDC recommended that all women be screened for group B strep at between 35 and 37 weeks of pregnancy. Recommendations are modified to recommend early screening now that colonization has been associated with preterm birth. Women positive for the bacteria should be treated with penicillin or AMP unless the bacterium is found to be resistant, in which case we go to erythromycin. And this is a look at group B strep colonization. Again, beta hemolytic okay, is going to produce a zone of clearing, a hazy zone of clearing on blood agar. Okay, that's how you're able to tell that you've got this pathogenic strain. This is a look at the pathogens that infect the female reproductive tract. Again, note the color coding. The fungi are in blue, the viruses are in green, and the bacteria are in brown. Okay. And here's the male. Okay, that concludes this podcast, and I will see everybody in the final podcast, and stay tuned. Thanks for listening.